Let's suppose that we live in some strange universe. So in our world, we define the antiderivative of a function f to be a new function. We'll call it maybe capital F, where capital F prime is equal to little f. But of course, that relies on us having a definition for the derivative. Well, let's suppose that instead of first defining the derivative and defining the antiderivative in terms of the derivative, we do the opposite. So in other words, we come up with some sort of, you know, from scratch definition of the antiderivative. So, well, what would that be? Well, I think it would be in terms of Riemann sums. And well, let's look at this proposed definition and then let's do some examples. So we'll use this standard notation for the antiderivative of f of x dx. So that'll be defined to be the integral from a to x of f of t dt, where a can really be any constant because that constant is related to, well, let's see the constant that you get for indefinite integration. But I will say that maybe a nice choice for this constant will be to be a place where f is equal to zero. Okay. But then we would define this in terms of a limit of a Riemann sum. So perhaps we would have the limit as n goes to infinity of delta t, and then the sum as little n goes from zero to n minus one of f of t sub n, where delta t is equal to x minus a over capital N, and t sub n is a plus n times, that should be a delta t there. Okay, well, now that we've got this taken care of, let's perhaps do a couple of examples. Let's maybe start with the example of the antiderivative of x dx. So of course, if all is good with the world, what should we get here? Well, we should get x squared over two, and that's because the derivative of x squared over two is x. But remember, we don't have the definition of this antiderivative in terms of the derivative in this strange world. Okay, so we'll take this to be the integral from zero up to x of t dt. So it's zero here because, well, if you evaluate the function x at zero, you get zero, and that's maybe a nice place to do it. But like I said, we could have this be any constant, and that's just like the constant of integration. Okay, and then this is gonna be equal to our limit as capital N goes to infinity of our delta T, but uh, notice that that's simply X over capital N in this case. And then we've got our sum as little n goes from zero to N minus one of well, f evaluated at t sub n, but that's simply t sub n here, which will be zero plus n times delta t. But now that's gonna be little n times x over capital N by, based off of our definitions over here. But now let's factor out as much as we can. So observe that we can factor an x squared out of the limit because the limit is with respect to capital N. That doesn't have anything to do with x. And then, well, we can factor this n in the denominator out of the sum, and that's simply because, well, that sum has an upper bound of capital N minus one, but the index doesn't have anything to do with capital N. And then we'll have our sum as N goes from zero up to N minus one of N. But observe that that's simply a triangular number. So in fact, we can maybe write this to see exactly what's going on. This is zero plus one plus two plus three, all the way up to n minus one. So that's the n minus first triangular number. Okay, well, there's a standard formula for the triangular number, so we'll use that now. So this is gonna give us x squared, and then we'll have our limit as capital N goes to infinity, we have a one over n squared, and then this is gonna end up giving us n squared minus n all over two. That's that sum in purple. Like I said, that's the well-known formula for the n minus first triangular number. But now let's observe that as n goes to infinity, n squared minus n over n goes to one, 
leaving us with this half for the value of the limit, which we can bring out, leaving us with x squared over 2. Okay, so that's nice. Well, it seems to have worked out pretty easily in this case. Let's maybe do another example. Okay, so for our next example, let's find the antiderivative of e to the x. Okay, so again, if all is right with the world here, we should calculate this to be e to the x because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. But I'll stress again that we're living in a world where the antiderivative and the derivative are not yet connected. Okay, so how would we do this? Well, I'm going to integrate this from something up to x of e to the t dt. And what's that something? Well, I'm going to take the something to be minus infinity. Of course, you can't plug minus infinity into the exponential function, but if you take the limit as the argument approaches minus infinity, you get zero. So this is the value for which um, the function takes on zero. Okay. So now let's rewrite this as the limit as a goes to minus infinity of our integral from a up to x of e to the t dt. So doing it like this, we can more appropriately use our, you know, definition of the antiderivative. Okay, so now let's see what we get here. This is going to give us the limit as capital A goes to minus infinity, not capital A, just A. And then the limit as capital N, that's where the capital is, goes to infinity of, well, we've got our delta T, so that's X minus A over N, but I'm just gonna write this as delta T in this case. And then we've got our sum as little n goes from zero up to N minus one of, so this is gonna be E to the a plus n times delta t. So I'm going to write this as a times e to the delta t raised to the n power. And well, observe that if we smush all of this back together using standard exponential rules, well, ar the arithmetic of exponentials, we get e to the a plus little n times delta t, which is exactly e to the t n as needed. So I really didn't do anything fancy right here. Okay, great. But now, well, what are we going to do from here? Well, let's look at this and observe that this will give us a finite geometric series. Maybe let's extend this to include the sum. So here we have a finite geometric series. And then observe that the starting term is e to the a, and our common ratio is e to the delta t. But there's a standard formula for the sum of a finite geometric series, so yet let's use that here. So we'll have our limit as a goes to minus infinity. I'm just bringing some of this stuff down, and then capital N is approaching infinity. We'll have Let's see, an e to the a times a delta t, just bringing that e to the a out. And then for our formula, like I said before, for the finite sum of a geometric series, this will give us e to the capital N times delta t. So capital N times delta t. It's really e to the delta t raised to the capital N because it's the common ratio to the power that's one more than our top index for what it's worth. And then we've got a minus one over e to the delta t minus one. Okay, so I think this is looking pretty good, but now notice we can do a bit of simplification with this n times delta t given our definition of delta t over here. And this is in fact equal to e to the x times e to the minus a. Okay, so if we replace that e to the n delta t with e to the x times e to the minus a, multiply this e to the a through, we have something that's uh, actually pretty nice and is almost all the way at the end of this problem. Just bringing my limits down. And now I'm gonna write this as uh, delta t over e to the delta t minus 1. And then after that, I'm going to have an e to the x minus an e to the a over, 
Well, actually not over anything, just e to the x minus e to the a. So, okay, so I think that's looking pretty good. But now observe that this thing that I'm underlining in blue is completely determined by the value of delta t. There's no capital N's. Well, there's no free capital N's left. So now we can do a change of variables for our limit. And that is, instead of taking n to infinity, we'll take delta t to zero. And then furthermore, let's notice that this bit right here doesn't have anything to do with delta t, whereas this bit right here in blue doesn't have anything to do with a. So we can actually factor this into two limits. So let's do that. This is gonna end up giving us the limit as delta t goes to zero of our delta t over e to the delta t minus one times our limit as a goes to minus infinity of e to the x minus e to the a. Okay, I think that's pretty good. But now let's observe that this second limit is pretty clearly equal to e to the x because e to the a will approach zero as a approaches minus infinity. That was kind of the whole point of choosing that minus infinity there. So here we're gonna have an e to the x. And now we just have to insert the value of that first limit. But let's recall that one of the definitions for the special number e, the natural base for the exponential function is that this type of limit is equal to one. You can actually uniquely define e like that as the number for which this type of limit is equal to one. So that means, well, that limit is equal to one, leaving us simply with e to the x as expected. And that's a good place to stop.